us today and also those who are worshiping with us online. There are a few announcements in the bulletin that I would draw your attention to. As always, following worship, there will be a time of fellowship and food and fellowship hall. We are celebrating January birthdays today with birthday cakes, so if you have a January birthday, please make sure that you stop by for a piece of birthday cake. There are several other events happening this week in the life of the church. Please take note. Session is meeting Tuesday evening. We had to postpone our meeting last week. <clears throat> also coming up in February is the annual meeting. And also a reminder to mark your calendars for the returning Latin Soup and Concert series that is coming in March. That will benefit Project SHARE, as always. As you can see, we have had uh, the choir dismissed today. Um, we've had a number of cases of COVID come through the church in the last week, six that I'm aware of. So please do continue to be careful out there. Um, but the choir will hopefully be back next Sunday. And finally, we do have a minute for mission today from the deacons talking about Super Bowl Sunday. Kathy. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Kathy Malvey, and I'm proud to be a deacon here at First Presbyterian Church. I'm here to announce our second, hopefully, annual Super Bowl Sunday. Now, I'm not a big fan of uh, football, but I am a big fan of fun, food, fellowship, and helping others. So, the, the Super Bowl does all of that. So, whatever your team is, whoever you're rooting for in the playoffs, on, on February, Sunday, February the 12th, we want you to don those jerseys, sweatshirts, colors, whatever, and come, and uh, the deacons are sponsoring a soup luncheon right after the game. We would like you to participate in this mission by either purchasing cans of soup, doesn't matter, any kind will do, whether you're a chunky person or a progresso or just a plain chicken noodle um, or generic, store brands work. Um, you can buy cans of soup and put, there's goalposts set up in Fellowship Hall, and you can put your cans of soup under the goalposts that you, the, of the AFC or the NFC. If you don't want to shop and go out and it's hard for you, cash works. So what we're doing it this year is we're, for every $2 you contribute, we're going to count that as a can of soup. And you can then pick your AFC or NFC. Just put your money in an envelope, put it in a soup pot. And we will then, on the day, we will count how many cans of soup and how much money we have. Last year, we predict the winner. So we, oh. sorry, Tony. <laughs> we, the a a LA won, and we, we our, our soup cans made that prediction. So I hope you guys all will join us and come out and support this function. Uh, last year we collected 341 cans and $300. Uh, Project Share has a goal of $6,000 for this um, Super Bowl. Last year they had they made 4,195. So let's see if we can have it on, in our hearts to have fun, fellowship, and support Super Project Share. If you have any questions, I'm in fellowship. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Kathy. Ohio never wins anything, so. Well, come on. And uh, Super Bowl luncheon is after worship, not after the game. Oh. You said after the game. <laughs> right after. Just to be clear, everyone, there will be plenty of time to get home and watch the free game. Plenty of time. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice together and be glad in it. Let us worship God.
The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? From our daily labors, the Lord summons us. Free from fear, we are bold to follow. Hear now the good news. 
who is in a position to condemn us? Only Christ is in that position. And Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. Christ prays for us. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. Behold, the old life is gone, a new life has begun. Hear and believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Amen. <laughs> sing the never-ending song of praise, today's anthem, be sure to come back next Sunday. Okay. When I'm told that's what we will be singing. The second lesson today is from Matthew's Gospel, <clears throat> chapter 4, 
verses 12 through 25, Jesus here is calling his first disciples. Listen again to the word of God. Now when Jesus heard that John, that is John the Baptist, had been arrested, he withdrew to Galilee. He left Nazareth and made his home in Capernaum by the sea, in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that what had been spoken through the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Land of Zebulun, land of Naphtali, on the road by the sea, across the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. For those who sat in the region and shadow of death, light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to proclaim, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. As he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, in the boat with their father Zebedee, mending their nets. And he called them. Immediately they left the boat and their father followed him. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and curing every disease and every sickness among the people. So his fame spread throughout all Syria. Then they brought to him all the sick, those who were afflicted with various diseases and pains, demoniacs, epileptics, and paralytics, and he cured them. And great crowds followed him from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and from beyond the Jordan. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. 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 Let us pray. Make us to know your ways, O Lord. Teach us your paths. Lead us in your truth and teach us, for you are the God of our salvation, and our hope is in you all day long. Amen. Jesus is here at the start of his ministry, after his baptism, after being tempted in the wilderness for 40 days. He comes back, and John has been arrested, and so Jesus heads north, north to Capernaum, the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, where his ministry begins in earnest. The ministry that we have come to know from the Gospels. And so what are some of the things we find Jesus doing in the Gospels? I was going to have this be interactive, but then I remember that you're Presbyterians. <laughs> Don't really do that. So <laughs> nod your heads if you agree with some of these things that Jesus does in the Gospels. We find Jesus teaching and preaching. Oh, good job. <laughs> Performing miracles. Yes, healing the sick, giving sight to the blind, driving out demons. We find him hanging out with the wrong kind of people, right? Sinners. You might say. We find him criticizing religious authorities, yes. And in the end, we find Jesus dying on the cross and three days later rising from the grave. What I miss? Oh, yeah. Jesus makes disciples. Jesus comes and makes disciples. Followers who go along with him our partners in ministry, to continue his ministry, even after he returns to God. Matthew's Gospel this morning turns our attention to Jesus calling disciples, his first 
disciples to share in this ministry. This is the point where I should be tempted to say that these are no ordinary men that Jesus calls. The fact of the matter is, they are incredibly ordinary men who Jesus calls. Average Joes, we might say. <clears throat> Brothers Peter and Andrew are actively working. They are casting their nets in order to catch some fish to eat and to sell. When Jesus walks by one day and simply says, follow me. And they drop their nets and they follow him. And a bit further down the shore, another pair of brothers, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, are sitting in their boat with their father, mending their nets, and Jesus again walks by and says, follow me. And in both cases, the pairs of brothers leave everything behind, boats and oars and nets and livelihoods and even their family, in order to go follow Jesus. Now maybe you've heard this story before. Maybe not. Maybe if you've heard this story before, you thought, yeah, right, leave everything behind. That sounds like a bit much. I don't think that's feasible. I don't think that's possible. That's too much to follow Jesus. Maybe that's what you're thinking today. Maybe this is the first time you're hearing this story. And maybe you're thinking, wow, that's a big ask. But maybe you're also thinking, what is it about Jesus that is so compelling, that is so compelling, that we leave these men to drop everything, to leave it all behind, and to follow Jesus? The call to discipleship is compelling for those who hear it and respond to it. But that call to discipleship, it doesn't look the same for each of us. It looks different for all of us. When Jesus calls Peter and Andrew and James and John, is it a call to general discipleship or is it a call to something more? What we might think of as ordained ministry. There's a lot of back and forth in the commentaries and among scholars about the interpretation of this. And there are good arguments to be had on both sides. But the truth of the matter is that everyone who is called by Jesus, from the least to the greatest, and everyone in between, all of us who are disciples of Jesus, are called to some form of ministry. It might be teaching and preaching, but it also might be serving and caring and sharing God's love in practical ways with neighbors and friends. We are all called to do some kind of fishing for the Lord. Now it's amazing that Jesus calls these regular ordinary people to be his disciples. Peter and Andrew and James and John, they do not have impressive resumes. They don't have multiple degrees. It's not like they've even been very far from the shores of Galilee during the span of their short lives. And yet Jesus sees them and he says, follow me. And I think those words ring out because they stand alone. Jesus doesn't say to the brothers, follow me because you've got great qualifications. Follow me because you've got stellar references. Follow me because you've got amazing job experience. That's how the world would evaluate someone. Instead, Matthew reminds us that God's word, incarnate in Jesus Christ, the word of God is sufficient for the disciples' call. Peter and Andrew and James and John, they aren't especially qualified to be disciples. Their call is not about their own personal experience of salvation. It is a call to discipleship. It is a call to active service in the kingdom of God. They will be sent out to be part of Jesus' ministry and will continue it even after he has returned to sit at the right hand of God in glory. Those regular, ordinary men called to be Jesus' first disciples also have these incredibly ordinary jobs 
They're fishermen. Professionals, but fishermen nonetheless. It's quite literally how they put food on the table for themselves and their families. Now, I don't know a whole lot about fishing, but I had a couple of conversations with some residents, resident experts this week who know a lot more about fishing than I do. Neither of them are here today. I think I must have scared them. <laughs> Dick Dar and Mike Staney were helpful, and they patiently answered my questions, and both of them told me way more about fishing than I ever thought I needed to know or wanted to know. Things like the best time to fish is dawn or dusk when the temperatures are lower and fish come to the surface, and it's good to fish with a full moon, and so many things about fishing. Now, I've preached this passage a number of times over the years, and I have to confess that every time I read it, in my mind, I picture Peter and Andrew and James and John being invited, being invited by Jesus to be the kind of fishermen that you see on TV or in the movies. The traditional North American fishermen, right? With hip waders and that vest with all those little pockets and the hat and the rod and the reel and the basket and the worms and the hooks and the flies and all of that. Casting, casting off and catching fish one at a time. One at a time. Catching believers, millions, one at a time. It was the image of a traditional fisherman standing on the edge of a lake or sitting in a rowboat that I had in my mind. And maybe that's how you thought of this text, too. But then Dick Dar said something that made me realize these disciples are not fishing. These are professional fishermen. They're not fishing for sport. This was serious business. They needed to catch as many fish as possible, both to feed their families and to sell in the local markets. And we know from the text that they are using nets to catch their fish, not rods and reels and hooks and worms. They are using nets to catch their fish. When Jesus promises that they will be fishers of men, fishers of people, I think he's saying to Peter and Andrew and James and John and to all of us future disciples, is something like, go out there and cast your nets wide. Don't fool around with a rod and a reel and a worm and a hook. Cast your nets wide. Spread the word of God around freely, as much and as often as you can. Don't be afraid to share the word of God. Get it out there and let it do what it needs to do. I like that image of casting the nets wide because it takes courage and dedication and hard work to fish that way. It's not easy. Nets are heavy. And you might cast that net out a hundred times, and every time it might come back empty. And you might be disappointed and, and tempted to go home. But the hundred and first time might be when it comes back full. At the end of John's Gospel, after the resurrection, Jesus appears on the shore of the Sea of Tiberias where some of his disciples are fishing early one morning. They've been out all night on the lake, but they hadn't caught anything. And certainly they were ready to head for the shore and to get some sleep. That's when Jesus calls out to them, you don't have any fish, do you? They don't recognize that it's Jesus, and they simply say to him, no, no, we don't have any fish. And Jesus says, cast your net to the right side of the boat one more time. Cast your net, and you will find some. So that's what they do. They cast their net one more time. And this time, 
catch so many fish that they can't even haul it in to the boat. The disciples are bereft after Jesus' crucifixion. They thought that life was over. That's why they've gone back to fishing, their old jobs. But Jesus reminds them, reminds us, that God's word is living and active, and God's word is sufficient. On their own, these few disciples, they couldn't catch anything all night long. But when Jesus speaks, when Jesus says, cast the net to the right side of the boat, Suddenly, the catch is abundant and overwhelming, and the nets are full. That's when Peter realizes who is standing on the shore. He realizes it's Jesus, and the text says he jumps into the water and swims to him, leaving the others to struggle and haul in the nets. And when they finally get the nets out of the water and count up the fish, John records this peculiar little detail. He says there are 153 fish in the nets. It's an odd little thing to add, don't you think? Except that in the, in the Greek world at this time, there were 153 known species of fish. I think that's Jesus' way of saying that his disciples are no longer going to be limited to just Jewish fishermen, but that the gospel, the good news, the word of God will spread and will make disciples all over the whole wide earth. God's word will not return empty. It shall accomplish that which God purposes and succeed in the thing for which was sent, as the prophet Isaiah said. It is God's word, the living word, in Jesus Christ, that makes disciples. And God's word is sufficient for us and for each day. We don't make disciples by following the latest trends or fads or the ways of the world. We make disciples by sharing Jesus, the word of God. What Jesus says is sufficient. In hearing his word, we find encouragement. Encouragement to leave behind what needs to be left behind in our lives. The nets that preoccupy us and hold us back. And we are encouraged to follow the one whom we ought to follow. The one who has called us. The one who says, Cast your nets, the word of God, and cast them widely. And become fishermen who catch people. Amen. <laughs>
confirm what we believe using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From hence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. We join our hearts and minds together in prayer this morning. I invite you to continue to hold all those who are struggling with COVID in your prayers, prayers for their healing and recovery. Also, I invite you to continue keeping up prayers for peace in our world. Let us join our hearts and minds together and go to God in prayer.
many in this world who are hurting. We know that there are many who are afraid. We know that many live in violence and they are facing war and persecution. We pray again this day for the people of Ukraine and for peace to come upon that land, a just and lasting peace, O God. We pray also, O Lord, trusting and knowing that you are present, present with those who are suffering and struggling, with those who are hungry, with those who are fearful, lonely and afraid. Lord, in each instance, as you have moved toward us in Jesus Christ, give us the strength and the will, the hope, the desire to be able to move towards those who need your love. Lord, as we gather here this day, disciples of our risen Lord, We pray, O oh God, lifting up to your throne all of the joys and the concerns, the worries, the fears, the anxieties, all that we have, all that we are, we bring them to the foot of your throne. And we trust, O oh God, that even if we aren't able to sort them out, that you are, and that you are present in the midst of each and every one of our prayers. Do you hear them? Do you hear us? We trust and we pray, O oh Lord, that in each and every case, you are at work. That your hand is guiding us in each and every situation. And so we pray, O oh Lord, trusting and knowing that you hear us as we pray. And as Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debts. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom power and glory forever. Amen. We have the opportunity and the privilege to offer back to God a portion of what God has given to us in this life. The offering plates remain at the doors for your use. I invite you now to consider God's generosity and your response during the offering.
might support the weak and help the suffering, honor all people, love and serve the Lord rejoicing, the power of the Holy Spirit, the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you now and remain with you always. Amen. <laughs>